station. So we are delighted uh, to be here. I'm going to uh, primarily read um, what I have, and, and, let me, and I'll set the context. This is, I'm here to work on a, a, a book. So I'm, and the tentative title is, For the Sake of the World, uh, the mission of God and the morality of God's people. And so it's just, it's, it's really come out of a uh, about 15 years of engaging um, uh, those who, are, who have been called to go. They come through our seminary, engaging those who, who come to our seminary from, uh, from, from the world, engaging students at the University of New Orleans, and, uh, and then just a long history of um, of, of being in, in a church and churches that uh, that love love the world, and uh, and so that's that's kind of the passion that's grown out of this, and uh, and so uh, the 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 topic today is is really in some sense introductory to the larger work that I, that I want to do, but I but I hope it will kind of helps set the context for the things that we have to think about in, in when we think about ethics in, in general. And this could be when, when we think about ethics that we, uh, you know, when our church is right here, but also ethics when we have those opportunities as OCMS has regularly uh, to engage uh, the people of God who are, who are equipping and are, are leading in churches all over the world, uh, is there a way that we can also collaborate as we think about what ethics and ethics in a church in New Orleans are look like and, and the struggles we have and then the ethics that you have as well. So that's uh, that's the, kind of the background, which I think gives you a little bit of context. Now I'm going to share this, this document. And I'll uh, just leave it. I'll just leave it in that regard. Now, all I have on here really are some of the larger quotes that, that might be difficult to follow or at least, but um, the challenges. And, um, and, and the challenges started early. Uh, from its inception, the church has been compelled by God to plant seeds of the kingdom in unfamiliar soils to cultivate disciples in heterogeneous cultures who will manifest the character and the commands of Christ Jesus. What that character looks like and which commands to follow have been a source of conflict since Peter's startling visit to the house of Cornelius, breaching cultural boundaries and breaking religious taboos, as we find recorded in Acts chapter 10. Opening himself to understand a vision which God instructs him to eat unclean food and responding to the voice of the Spirit of God, Peter enters the house of Cornelius, a Roman centurion, Gentile, and God-fearer, and he declares something old and something new. Peter says, you yourself know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner, an alephilo, a, a Gentile, an alien, an outsider, or even to visit him. And yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. And that is why I came without even raising any objection when I was sent for I most certainly understand now that God is not to show partiality uh, in, uh, God is not to, uh, to show partiality, but in every nation and every ethne, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. Acts 10, chapters, chapter 10, verses 20 and 29, and again in 34 and 35. The welcome to which Peter refers is not a claim to ethical universalism or a confession that all morality and cultural mores are acceptable in the sight of God. The welcome is access to the Abrahamic promise of God through the gospel, the redemption of Christ Jesus. 
proclaiming the good news regarding the life, death, burial, resurrection, and exaltation of Jesus Christ, Peter concluded his sermon by pointing to the authority of the risen Savior. Jesus, Peter said, ordered us to preach to the people, Eliam, and solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Of him, all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. Verses 42 through 43. Luke then records that the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles, the ethne, those not belonging to Israel. Gambian historian Lamin Sine, in his book, Disciples of All Nations, said of that fateful day, and I think I have this for you to see, said of that faithful day that when Peter says it is common knowledge that it is unlawful for a Jew to associate with a person of another nation, he is identifying a crucial feature in the history of religion. Namely, religion is a lawful custom enshrined in binding cultural practices. In that conception of religion, God is a cultural marker bound up with mental activity and communal pride with religion set up to require conformity to a set of institutional and social norms. Peter's insistence that true religion cannot be restricted to mere institutional adherence signals a radical shift to the idea of God as boundary-free truth, of God as one who is without partiality and who, as such, is open to the genuine moral asp aspirations of all humanity. To open the way for the gospel to go to the nations, the identifying ethic of God's own people had to be modified. The ethic called into question was not that of Cornelius, who was described as a devout, righteous, generous, and God-fearing man, but that of Peter. The modification was not arbitrary, however, but was instituted by the finished work, resurrection, and exaltation of God the Son and inaugurated and empowered through the appearing of the Spirit of God. The laws of uncleanliness, which were precious to Peter, the Jew, were revoked by God to open the way for him to engage Cornelius with the gospel. These laws were not inherently wrong, but were no longer necessary to identify the people of God under the new covenant inaugurated by the cross of Christ. To borrow from the Apostle Paul, God, the lawgiver, retired and replaced the tutor that was to lead us to Christ. For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. Galatians 3, 24 and 26 through 28. In the resurrection of Jesus, a new humanity has begun, one that includes all nations and enables humans to become fully human image bearers of the one who is the image of the invisible God and God's covenant people, stewarding reconciled creation. God's openness to us today calls the genuine moral aspirations of all humanity is not to emphasize an earlier point, opening the door to universalizing moral subjectivism, where no one is truly guilty because right and wrong, good and bad, honesty and shame are merely relative, uh, determined by each individual or community, such that what is morally true for you is true for you, and what is morally true for us is true for us. God is not indifferent to lawlessness, shame, and idolatry of human beings. Humans are created God imagers, not intended to be sources of evil, suffering, and destruction in the world. The grand narrative of Scripture makes that clear. Peter's conclusion that God appointed Jesus to judge the living 
and the dead, and that through his name, everyone who believes receives forgiveness of sin, makes the moral life of every human being and the morality of the cultures that shape every human life subject to and relative to God alone. Accordingly, Sine goes on to ask a question that the church must continually ask as the gospel is sown and takes root and grows in multicultural, uh, multicultural soils. And I have this quote here. How can Christianity maintain its commitment to culture insofar as culture embodies faith in a concrete way? while avoiding the sorts of cultural idolatry that fuses truth claims and exclusive national ideals. Ask another way, how might Christians going into the world to make disciples and diagnose culturally embedded moralities? Whether the culture is familiar or alien, it doesn't matter. The diagnoses are to determine how to navigate cultural and social contexts in such a way that Christians develop morally to reflect new life in Christ Jesus. Acts 10 raises recurring moral questions for the church, particularly for those called to make disciples in cultures that are untouched or little touched by the covenant and the commands of God. What I aspire to do in the short time that we have today is to address some of the limitations and challenges inferred by the surprising revision of the law in Acts 10 and the challenges experienced in the mission of God to the nations. Will the church, as those called from among the nations to be in the nations, live according to the way or get in the way of the mission of God? A challenge uh, in every human culture is how to communicate meaning, whether in a microculture like a family, a set of friends or a local church where misunderstandings happen all the time and they disrupt everyday life, or in macro socio-political cultures where misunderstandings can create profound disruptions and sufferings. Communications can be a challenge whether a teacher is addressing a classroom full of students who live in the same community and speak the same language, or a Korean missionary is making introductions in a Korowai village in Papua, Indonesia. The challenges of the latter are immeasurably greater than the former, but communication in any context is challenging. Difficulties in communication are not only, not only challenging for the indigenous persons who interact with expatriates, but are also a challenge for an author trying to make a point. And so I think it's important for us to, uh, to think about the terms that, that I'm using in, in, in come to the same place on the meaning of those terms. And so what I'm going to do at this point is just kind of look at the issue through the terms that we're using and you will locate those, uh, those um, difficulties within those terms themselves. The first term, uh, I think we need to come to an agreement on society. In the gospel, in human context, the book, The Gospel in Human Context, Paul Abair, and I, do, I say his name like a good Cajun would, so Abair is how we would pronounce it, or Cajun would pronounce it. I'm not a Cajun. Um, he defines society as the system of relationships that enable people to form communities. Society refers to how individuals and groups organize and identify themselves. These social constructs carry assumed expectations for how one person or group relates to other persons or groups. Individual identities are in large measure determined by our society or who our society says that we are. Describing the makeup of the kinds of communities in which most people live, Hebert notes by way of example some different ways that societies might distinguish people. Women and men, tall and short, young and old, dark and light skin, long and short nose, poor and rich. Some of these differences are innate, others acquired. Most we ignore or note only in passing. Others we highlight to organize our society. 
is these that our society uses as markers to give us our identities as persons in social context. They define who we are and how we should behave. They set us apart from others and shape how we see and relate to them. In other words, our identities as persons and as groups of people and the expected relationships between us are social constructs. Now, let me clarify one point, and that is that innate characteristics of the body, such as sex, ethnicity, natural features, and so forth, are not social constructs. How one is expected to relate to persons with certain characteristics is socially constructed. Innate features such as physical or mental disabilities, along with accidental qualities such as wealth, religion, relationships to power structures, communal hierarchies, and so forth, create psycho socio psychological identities, peers, classes, castes, outcasts, and so forth that organize the social settings of cultures. And as you can see by the very way that we talk about the way the societies might uh, um, name people uh, is, is, a, is a point in which missional ethics needs to address. A similar overarching concept is the term context, which uh, Kirk Franklin, Paul Bendor Samuel, there's Paul here, kudos, Paul, and Deborah Crow, and I'll, I will pitch the book. Uh, I read this book. It didn't take long to read. I left, read it last week. It's really good. It's very helpful. But they defined a context as the unique environment and perspective of the world where God's mission occurs. I didn't say the, the title of the book. There's the mission matrix. It is the, uh, one of the newest titles coming out of the Regnum <laughs> Press. Um, yeah, where was I? Uh, da, 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 da. Let me read, let me start that definition again. It's the partially integrated system of ideas, feelings, and values. I have jumped ahead. Excuse me, I got to, I got to stop in a second. Um, Context, okay. Context, uh, context include culture, socioeconomic, political realities, and other areas of human life. Context encompasses the fields in which the gospel is sown, such that the church grows as witness to the redeeming and transformative work of God. This Missio Dei. Said another way, there is no context off limits to the mission of God. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and those who dwell in it. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 26, quoting Psalm 24, verse 1. Culture is the, the term traditionally used to address the church in context or the church crossing contexts to fulfill the Great Commission. What exactly is the church in and what is being crossed. In his 1943 articles that were later published as notes toward the definition of culture, T.S. Eliot expressed frustration that the term culture was used but rarely defined. Such is no longer the case. Christopher Walken in Biblical Critical Theory exclaims how the pendulum has swung. It seems impossible to advance 10 paces into a book on Christian worldview these days without being assailed by a lengthy definition of culture and hot on its heels, a lengthy definition of worldview. It's become something of a rite of passage. And, and that is, by the way, now uh, what I must attempt, passage I must attempt with a couple of others. <laughs> culture, according uh, to Paul Hebert, is the partially integrated system of ideas, feelings, and values encoded in learned patterns of behavior, signs, products, rituals, beliefs, worldviews that are shared by a community of people. 
John Stott adds that there are no culture-free axioms or universally accepted self-evident principles or rules because the mindset of human beings has been formed by the culture in which they have been brought up. Their presuppositions, their value systems, the ways in which they think, the degree of their receptivity or resistance to new ideas are all largely determined by their cultural inheritance and are filters through which they listen and evaluate. Consequently, culture is an intersection of the practices and beliefs of a community of human beings or that which your people inherit and attain and hold to be true about the world, both consciously and unconsciously, are outwardly displayed through language, relationships, practices, and artifacts. Or as Leslie Nubigen describes, culture is the sum total of the ways of living developed by a group of human beings handed, uh, handed on from generation to generation, a set of beliefs, experiences, and practices that seek, seek to grasp Sorry, I'm on the wrong slide here. I didn't put this one in. The seat to, to grasp is a set of beliefs, experiences, practices that seek to grasp and express the ultimate nature of things, that which gives shape and meaning to life, and that which claims final loyalty. Culture is that which we experience through all of our senses, our sights, our sounds, our tastes, our smells, the textures of life lived in community. Culture is where moralities are exposed and expressed, where one sees the consequences of their ethic, their ways of working out or understanding right and wrong, good or, good or bad, just or unjust, virtue and vice or honor and shame. From the outside, morality is seen. Ethics is analyzed and applied and the presuppositions that authorize morality and ethics in particular cultures must be sought and discerned and evaluated through immersion into that culture. To that end, culture and context, the form in which a people's worldviews are lived is the bailiwick of social scientists and anthropologists and ethnographers, but Cultures are also the setting for the mission of God. Worldview is the concept that describes the nature of the presuppositions that support cultures and concepts and contexts. Paul Hebert defines worldview as the most fundamental and encompassing uh, fundamental encompassing views of reality shared by a people and culture. War views are the cognitive, affective, and evaluative presuppositions a group of people make about the nature of things in which they use to order their lives. War views are what people in community take as given realities, maps they have of reality that they use for living. War views touch every aspect of how people live in the world. Robert Strauss and Tom Steffen describe worldviews as interpretive and interactive grids, which are emotionally held. They shape personal and collective identities. As a whole system, a worldview gives meaning to every aspect of life. They're usually formed in affectionate relationships and reinforced through ritual that, sh is, that are shaped by stories and symbols. Strauss and Steph, Stephen argue further that worldview change does not come through learning new ideas. It comes through relationships that challenge us to rethink life. In other words, worldviews are a primary interest of ethics. Not all who write on culture and on ethics find the concept of worldview helpful, however. For example, those uh, though acknowledging the conceptual value of the term and several alternatives offered in its place, Christopher Watkin proposes the simple term world, the use of which points to a set of particular figures that give rhythm to the space 
time, ideas, reality, behavior, and relationships in a particular sphere of life, among a particular community, or in a particular artist work, for example, giving them distinctive style. This idea of style for Watkin or of the world appearing in a particular way is also present in the sense of the New Testament Greek term for the word cosmos, a term that Oliver O'Donovan reminds us points not simply to everything there is, but quite specifically to its manner of appearing to us in the sense that we mean when we say, this is my world or this is our world. For Watkin, every culture deploys multiple patterns, narratives, pictures, and images, vocabulary, in order to create a world, or a worldview, or what Charles Taylor describes as a social imaginary. They're, he's basically talking about the same things. But the Bible has its own narratives and images and patterns that enable us to analyze any culture at the deepest level and to both critique and appreciate it, while at the same time preventing us from being captured and co-opted by it. Oliver O'Donovan, suspicious of the philosophical abstractions that open the way or open the concept to the formation of ideologies, argues for confession. That is, confession or uh, Christians are those who receive a testimony, a testimony of the gospel, and bear witness to that which they receive. For O'Donovan, testimony or confession is what Christians have to take the place of a worldview, a message about the order of God's words, which we may both receive and give, a testimony to receive and amplify as it is passed through the thought and experience that it's given to us to live with. In other words, Christian confession takes priority or has authority over worldview because worldview is a pattern of the world and confession is that which redeems the world in our view of it. Confession for O'Donovan becomes a new pattern of being in the world. Regarding the gospel and our confession, the faith that was once handed down to the saints, as you find in Jude 3. I'm sorry, what has happened? No, oh, this is, we ran out of time. Sorry, so I just have to bear with me here. Donovan contends that confession offers a central and normative focus of joy, the resurrection of Christ, which becomes a torch to illumine the goods of the world, a vantage point from which we can explore, discover, and appreciate all other objects of joy. And when false imaginations of the world are overcome from this vantage point, the world that God made is made new for us and offers itself to new adventures of love and knowledge. In other words, the gospel through the Spirit of God changes the way a people see the world. Moreover, the confession of our faith centered in the gospel is at once the core, the defense, and the attraction of the Christian faith. Confession bears witness to the mission of God and confirms the missional activity of the church. Confession and witness speak both to the biblical content and necessary and varied forms of the message that the mission of God to the world entails. Christopher Wright, tying mission explicitly to God, states that fundamentally our mission, if it is biblically informed and validated, means our committed participation as God's people at God's invitation and command in God's own mission within the story of God's world for the redemption of God's creation. Because God's mission is the redemption of all creation, the movement of the church to the nations as part of that mission requires contextualization of the biblical message and its application to life in a variety of contexts. 
the contextualization of the Christian faith, according to David Hesselgrave, can be thought of as the attempt to communicate the message, message of the person, works, word, and will of God in a way that is faithful to God's revelation, especially as it is put forth in the teachings of Holy Scripture, and that is meaningful to respondents in their respective cultural and existential contexts. Aldrin Penyamara and Bernard Wong, however, point out that contextualization works both ways. For example, the history of Christianity in the West is not simply the gospel of Christ conquering the heathen, but Christianity being accepted by particular peoples, transforming their cultures, and itself being transformed at the same time. Some might argue that this two-way influence is in inappropriate a form of reverse syncretism, if you please. But mutuality and collaboration can be an important way that the mission of God is furthered in both contexts. If the authority is God's, if the boundaries are set by Scripture, and if the motivation is a desire to know and do the will of God in all contexts, then those who have the privilege to serve God in missions as Missionaries, for example, should gladly open themselves to the tutelage of those they serve. After all, no one person or culture except Jesus himself is the frame of reference for understanding what it means to be human. Mutuality and collaboration can happen only when contextual guests become students to their cultural hosts. Here, ethnography can aid both theology and ethics. Ethnography, according to Christian Sharon and Anna Marie Vegan, is a fitting tool for embodied theology. Ethnography is a way to take particularity seriously, to discover truth revealed through embodied habits, relations, practices, narratives, and struggles. And as it is joined with a theological sensibility, each particular life situation or community is potentially, albeit only partially, revelatory of transcendent or divine truth. Embodied theology recognizes that the Spirit of God, who is not culturally bound, is at work. In the process, an ethnographer is in an apprenticeship to the situation of the people, and, but also aids in the articulation of those embedded theological convictions as primary theology itself. This perspective does not preclude bringing into the conversation other theological or theoretical materials, but the point is that they do not automatically have privilege over the local theological understandings operative in the lives of those studied. An embedded process such as ethnography is helpful for understanding where people are theologically and ethically. And that is also true for those embedded as well. Ethnography as a part of embedded mutuality and collaboration must be grounded in scripture. Moreover, those doing ethnographical work should be grounded in theology and ethics. Seeking to ground crit critical can uh, excuse me, seeking to ground critical contextualization of scripture, Paul Hebert calls for the following steps. Exegesis first, exegesis of culture. Second, and by the way, an exegesis of culture is not done by the outside, but it's a process in which, in which uh, those within, uh, within the, the indigenous church are exegeting scripture. Uh, second is exegesis or, or, or exegeting their own culture, excuse me, the first is exegeting their own culture because they know what their culture is. The second is the exegesis of scripture related to the question at hand using what uh, Hebert calls a metacultural framework that enables translation into the cognitive, affective, and evaluative dimensions of a northern culture. And so, again, the same people are exegeting the texts. Third is a critical response by those within that culture, again, within the culture, 
who evaluate critically their own past cultures in light of their new political, excuse me, new biblical understandings. And there's a there's a collaboration going on as well for the one who might be uh, from the outside, who is trained or who is who is uh, who is uh, uh, is there to come alongside in, in, to, to to help disciple. There's a collaboration going on there in this process, but the hard work is done within the culture itself. Now I mentioned critical contextualization here in, in relation to divine ethnography. Because, uh, because I think they're, they're essentially attempting the same thing. Critical contextualization uh, neither rejects nor accepts the old or the, uh, the context, but critically evaluates cultural issues in relation to function and meaning in society and coherence with biblical norms. So that's that's what the, the biblical ethnographer is trying to do as well. So ethnography and critical contextualization establish processes for fruitful collaboration in the work of making disciples as the church engages the mission in cross-cultural and cross-contextual situations. In the 21st century, cross-contextual work is multi-directional. God still calls persons to move from home to cross cultures with the gospel. I believe that. I know many who do. But home may also, and that home may be the United States, but more likely now that home is Uganda or Korea or Cuba or any other place in the majority of the world where the church is found. And the move might be, might be across national borders, and it might be, but the move may also be crossing cultural borders within a nation. The mission is God's, and God's church is global. Moreover, the world is coming to, to the churches. Just look at Oxford, just look at New Orleans or, or Athens, and Lagos or Bucharest as examples. Some of the movements are voluntary, Many are forced by tragic circumstances. Immigration and diaspora are opportunities for the church to bear witness to God who loves the world and desires reconciliation and who also delights in the diversity of those who will one day stand and worship before the throne of God. Until that day, however, the mission of God is the mission of the church, and an important part of the mission of God requires the church to make disciples from the nations, disciples who are growing both theologically and morally. In the spirit of partnering and collaborating to make disciples, my concern is for a sanctifying ethic that leads to a morally characterized, a morality that is characterized by righteousness and justice. To that end, I am working on a theological ethical framework that integrates mission theology with mission practice in what Franklin, Bender Samuel, and Crow, adapting a model by Van Egen, calls an integrative missional or missionological matrix. This integration is the concern of missional ethics. Do I have a few more minutes? Um, yes, another three, four minutes. Okay. The theological, ethical, uh, ethical framework I propose does not provide a key to unlock and answer all the ethical questions in the culture. For that, only the living God is qualified, and there's no reason for me to hold such key. I'm simply suggesting that if we engage believers from multiple contextual contexts and consider together the reality of God revealed sufficiently, though in part in Scripture, and fully in Christ Jesus, that we can together be on the way that pleases God, a moral way. Leslie Newbigin, having argued, argued that truth with a capital T is not timeless propositions, but a living Lord who undertakes to lead us into the fullness of truth as it is present in him, says if we accepted the authority of the Bible, then we understand ourselves as being in via, not possessors of eternal truth, 
but part of a living tradition of discipleship on a way of truth that will be perfectly known, known on that day when the author of this story brings it to an end and, and consummation. This way of truth is both theological and moral. As such, missional ethics in part reflects and strategizes on how those called to make disciples in unfamiliar settings might collaborate with indigenous churches in the development of people who are glorified Christ within concrete, observable, local moralities. These moralities should reflect the word of God in a true humanity that is displayed both in both sending and receiving cultures. Just to give you a little description of what that uh, framework looked like, uh, it is a theological framework. It is uh, one in which, and as and, and, and is at bottom theological. Now, uh, you know, why are we to have the bottom line theological? Or in, for an ethic and morality. I think it's because all human ethics is accountable to the reality and revelation of God. Consequently, the telos for all humans is not ultimately to be determined by reason or culture or contextuality, but by conformity to the image of God, by renewal of mind and discipline and transformation into the image and likeness of Christ Jesus, the Son of God. How does this moral transformation that is accountable to the reality and revelation of God happen in a world that is not only alienated from God, but alienated one culture from another? It happens through reconciliation to God through Christ and incorporation by the Spirit of God into a people formed by the true story revealed in the Bible. Christopher Wright describes this true story as the grand narrative that constitutes truth for all. In other words, our starting point is not anthropology, sociology, or psychology per se, despite the benefits gained from these disciplines. Our starting point is God revealed in Scripture, such that our missional ethic is worked out in the economy of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and applied to that which God created, including actual people in various ethno-linguistic contexts. Hebert also sets Christian ethics under the reality of God. Morality, he says, is not based on a set of impersonal laws that exist apart from God. These laws are God's moral commands, and righteousness is living in right relationship with God, with one another, and with the world. Missional theology, and therefore ethics, is God's people seeking to live as God's people in a fallen and never-changing world, and to bear witness to God's kingdom to the world around them. If this is the case, then to live as God's people means that we should know well this God who we serve, represent, and worship. What then would an ethical framework for missions cultivated in light of the triune God look like? A missional theology that informs ethics according to Hebert would seek to formulate and communicate universal truth, the cognitive, love, the affective, and holiness, the moral, in partial, in particular even context, are very diverse. I would not, however, bracket the moral life from the cognitive and the effective from truth and love. Rather, a missional theology that informs ethics would first seek to find in God the Father the character and virtues that honor God, seek to find in Christ Jesus the logos, the word of God, that which is spoken by God to, to, to direct the moral life in a way that demonstrates love and obedience, and seeks from the Spirit of God, who is present with God's people, to enliven the Word of God and manifest the character of God, so that the people of God might love the Lord with all their hearts and love their neighbors and enemies as themselves. This ought to be the foundational framework 
of Miss Malefics. And that's what I will do in several chapters each. Thank you for your attention. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for that. Is good. that possible to? Yeah, let me stop sharing this. Thank you. Um, everyone, and uh, people on the Zoom, if you have any questions, please use the, the button uh, image or uh, signs. Just raise your hand. And, and also the rooms we have here, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. And thank you so much, um, Professor Jeffrey, uh, for inviting us with lots of food to uh, digest and think, and especially locating ourselves in your talk. Well, I hope you don't get indigestion. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it has. It was really very interesting and very enlightening, and especially now I understand your question standing in the way. And uh, so, uh, can I start uh, while other people have um, are thinking to formulate their questions? Uh, your definition of mission is still based on a culture sends someone, a person, sends from one culture to another. Not, not completely. I, I didn't. I, I probably needed to be more clear about that. I, I, I think that um, the mood to speak about the mission as as uh, the missio dei, the mission of God. Uh, sets the tone for what mission is. It's God's mission, which means it's, it's it's happening wherever the church is. But I still recognize that there are that God still calls some out to go. And, and, and but it's not, but it's not the uh, uh, in the same sense that for much of the 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 nineteenth and, and and most of the twentieth century, how uh, church and still some now understand that you know it is missions it is we're talking about the sending aspect we're talking about uh the need for you know this group to send to that group uh you know the the, the, the way that missio dei has been developed and, and you see it in you know some would say it, it kind of begins with bart i don't think it has necessarily have a starting place there but it's certainly been developed and accepted uh, by evangelicals such as Christopher Wright and, and others, that, that what, we're, what we're involved in is, is bigger than just our group sending. It is, is our group being obedient to that which is around us. And then if God, if God calls us to collaborate and, and to, um, and to uh, engage the church in another setting, it's not that we go in order to simply give, but it is part of the process in which God is making us who we ought to be, as well as that the the the, uh, the, recept the recipients, I suppose, and who they ought to be. Does that? Yeah, it does yeah. make sense. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, the reason I ask that question is, I was listening to you from being a convert and for me actually it was my worldview who helped me to understand Christianity and helped me to formulate my confession and my witness and that is why I, I mean I like Oliver O'Donnell writings mm -hmm. but when self I'm making a confession above the worldview yeah, and I, the word view for helps us to really make sense of our yes, confession. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know that O'Donovan is, as you know, complex. Uh, yes, he was a, uh, yeah. one of the professors in the university, Edinburgh University. Yes. And, yes. And so I don't know that O'Donovan would want to 
and, and it, it made and, it, and the quotes I gave may, may give it that in, in, indication. I, I didn't intend it to do that, but I don't know that he intends the confession to uh, the, to to take over the worldview in the sense, okay, here's the worldview, here's the worldview, uh, and, and here's the confession. And therefore, um, we're going to take the worldview from this so they can say, take the worldview out, and now this is, this is what happens. Uh, because that's, what that does is it, it uh, removes the preparation. Uh, it, it removes the... Uh, in some sense, the humanity of those who uh, who are in, in in other cultures, and it does not recognize that 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 the distinguishing marks of those in other cultures is also part and parcel of what God is doing in the world. Now, for there to be transformation, I, I, my, our worldviews have are transformed by the gospel. Our worldviews are transformed by the confession. They ought to be transformed by the confession. I think that, at least as I understand O'Donnell, is what, uh, what the confessions of the faith ought to do, and that is to, uh, to be a transformation. You know, an early book that, and this is back when I was in seminary, that it, in some sense, it opened my eyes to the wonder of, of how God works in the world was uh, the peace child. Uh, was it Robin, Robin, Robinson? Robertson? I'm trying to think of the old one. Yeah, Dan Robertson. Richardson. <laughs> Richardson. Thanks. Part of that. Yeah, I think you're right. Richardson. That, that was a book that when I read that, I, I mean, that, I got excited. Mm. It's a man alive. God is at work, and 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 that's where you know, I want to I want to be involved in that. That's the, I want to I want to 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 see how God is working in that way, and 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 we see that by the way. Sometimes we think, well, we have to get we have to go across the world to see that God is working in our context mm -hmm. and and it, and is shaping of people to receive the the, the gospel. We, we can walk across the street, you know, anytime someone. Uh, uh, here's the gospel and makes a confession of faith. Uh, that's the work of God. It's not. It's not our work. Uh, we're involved in it. It's not the works of that person. Uh, faith is is, is the, the work of that, that person. But we're seeing God at work. So. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yes, David. Uh, oh, Jeff. Thank you, Ms. Saxon. Uh, Quite looking forward to your lecture now. I'm looking forward to your book. Uh, I don't know when it's going to be out, but uh, it's certainly something I'll, I'll, I'll like to read. Uh, we'll have to find a publisher. <laughs> <laughs> so I identify myself as a Protestant, Indian Protestant Christian, even though I belong to. Um, the Assemblies of God Church. Mm -hmm. uh, and historically, as I look back on I see the Western Church was um, known for demonizing my culture. Yes. And one of the ways in which they did, did it was to totalize Hinduism uh, and, and uh, make a caricature out of Hindus. Um, and, and forcing us to believe that um, everything in my culture was uh, demonic. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, there are demonic uh, elements in, in Hinduism, as there are demonic elements in other religions, including Christianity. Mm -hmm. but there are also godly aspects, mm -hmm. and, and there are plenty of them. So how does one explain all of that? It, it's all demonic. Yes. And so that was a bit of a problem for me growing up. Um, in a mission compound um, um, where I was told repeatedly by those who were in charge of the compound that I should not engage myself with, uh, with anybody outside because the world out there was evil um, and uh, all the rest of it. Uh, and they were the objects of mission to uh, were the holy people. We have separated ourselves from the world and it was our task 
reach out to them, bring them within within the machine compound. Mm -hmm. So that I was um, brought up in a context like that until um, good sense prevailed, and my parents rescued me from that. Mm -hmm. Kind of sent off to to, to um, a boarding school to study. Once my parents continued their mission work um, in a, in a very different mode. Uh, so so that that was one side of my experience. The other extreme, of course, is uh, Indian Catholicism that, um, in a sense, uh, um, nurtures um, uh, a dramatic identification with. With Hinduism, that is a problem as well. We have plenty of examples, for, both from history and now, uh, more currently within India, where um, missionaries uh, engaged in uh, laughable identification with Hindus. So people like Robert Dinobli, about whom you probably know, uh, became Brahmins, mm -hmm. so Christian Brahmins. He lived like a Brahmin, he ate like a Brahmin behaved like a Brahmin. Mm -hmm. And the Hindus were curious about what was going on, but they found that very funny. Uh, never, never, uh, he was never able to convince anybody to convert to Christianity. Mm -hmm. People thought he was funny. Uh, um, I think um, this serious bit of contextualization, contextual theology, emerged in the post-colonial text of India. This is when Indians decided that it was important for them to recognize that theology, doing theology is not a, not a job for the elite. The subaltern can speak. Um, people on the margins, people who are oppressed have a voice. They have something to say about who God is and how we should behave if we recognize who God is. This lines up with the point you made about critical theory. Um, and uh, this is something I know. Tim, Tim is not here. Tim, sadly, one of our colleagues, passed away recently. Mm -hmm. He was a, a very well-known crit critic of critical theory. Yeah. But not us, uh, especially those of us who had some experience of colonialism, uh, obviously do not uh, think uh, anything is wrong with critical theory. <laughs> we think Samalton can speak, and we are. Uh, I am one of those people who, who has found a voice in, in this new climate. So what is important is embedding, and I really liked your, your, your use of that term, relation geography. Embedding is like, like um, incarnation. It's uh, observing and participating at the same time. Yeah. So that's the kind of theology and ethics, I think, uh, I would like to see around more and more people doing this kind of theology. And if we think uh, some people are simply not capable of doing theology, it is our job as, as Christians to enable them to think theologically yes. and not assume that they are simply incapable mm -hmm. of thinking theologically. Anyways, there's no question in it, um, but it's just it felt like making that uh, comment in response to your excellent presentation. Incidentally, this I skipped, I just jumped over I don't know how many pages, uh, most of which addressed that. Okay. So, and, uh, and then uh, I cut out. Uh, 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 it's the, I need. I need a chapter, uh, one chapter, just to deal deal with, with that aspect. Mm -hmm. And the um, uh, I, I don't think I I want to try to to get into writing simply a a, a, a rewrite a history of, of the mission movement, but uh, but as a way of learning from uh, not only what was. It was done well, but also it was not done well. And I and I I can't remember now which authors I read that it talked specifically about um about India mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. and and exactly as you as you described it there. And I could pull it up. 
I can't remember which off it was, but it, I'll be glad to hear from you good sources on that. Thank you. Thank you. Any uh, who likes to go next online? Yes, uh, Marina. Uh, thank you very much. I just, there's a thought that came into my mind was uh, when Sarah was talking about confession and worldview, I was thinking about the need of the people, the questions they have. If a gospel is brought, if the gospel or the message of Christ is brought to the people, does it take into account the questions and the need and the longing of the people? Because I believe that from the from from my own exp or from my own knowledge or experience of uh, my indigenous group, I come from the northeast, which is uh, one of the northeast state in Mizoram, which is a tribal community. And I believe that the gospel or whatever comes is brought to them has to speak to their needs, their longings. So uh, do you have any thoughts on that? That the, it's not just about confession, but it that the people are like also going back to what David said, they're not just passive, but they're also reflecting and they're also theologizing, trying to understand and make sense of what is being preached to them and being uh, told to them. And I think from my reading of the history of my own community, I would say that they accepted it, what makes sense to them, what they think is good for them, and not just something that is being propagated or that is being told to them. So that's just an observation or a comment that I would like to make. I think what I hear you asking is, um, does uh, um, can a missional ethic make or um, not only not well? You you uh, a question you asked I think had uh, about the gospel itself, but uh, and so I think the gospel is affects the whole person, so the, the cognitive and the affective are both uh, a part and parcel of. Um, of the messages of the gospel itself and of the activity of, of the spirit of God. And so if the question, uh, and I think that's a good question, and if, if I could even apply it to missional ethics, to the, to the ethics, to the discipleship that's going on, discipleship can't be just cognitive. Uh, that really doesn't, won't necessarily change a person. It has to be cognitive. Uh, it has to be affective as well. And uh, and I think that uh, it, the, where it will come out in the in the paradigm or the framework, the Trinitarian framework is is in the activity of the Spirit of God, because the activity of the Spirit of God in in um, in changing us and in maturing us is very personal and it, it's and it's also would be would come out in the fact that it it's not done in but this transformation is not done in a vacuum it is a community uh thing it is uh, the community that uh that you're with and in who understand the longings uh, that you have partially in the spirit of God who understands your longings completely is going to uh, is going to meet you there in order to trend in order to to affect a transformation in your life and the lives of the people around you uh, so that the Lord might be glorified in the way you live. Does that I, I think that's yes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to emphasize that the people that the people that the missionaries encountered are not just passive. They have their own longings. They know how to articulate what they want to. And so it's not one-sided affair, but it's both the missionaries and the people who are being uh, spoken to or who are being uh, preached to are going through a change through their interactions. And in the sense of trying to meet and understand in each other, especially if they come from different cultures. So I think that's very important in terms of contextualization that it's both parties who are going through a change and not just one group of people. Yes, yes. I mean, I don't, 
one of the things that I, I skipped over, and Ali appreciate this, is is a sense of hospitality and this key mm -hmm. to this embeddedness, and in this uh, and in the, the discipleship that happens and make it brings transformation in the lives of people. I think uh, that it's in that embedded embeddedness and hospitality that, that the longings of uh, and the yearnings of the heart are met. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? I'm just... so, it's, um, it's... Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> maybe a, a comment and, and a question. Um, I, I grew up in mission schools, uh, mission boarding schools. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I came here to Osim as one of the required readings, um, I remember it introduced me to this idea of uh, the David Livingston model versus the William Carey model of the mission work and kind of a comparing and con contrasting. Uh, and the idea is that both had good intentions, both were carrying the gospel to the nations. Uh, one was, uh, uh, the, the comparison was that one was more from the school of thought that I'm here to help. Uh, it was not a lack of compassion for the people or heart for the people. In fact, you know, his heart was buried there in, in Africa. Mm -hmm. But there was no faith that outside of my models and my 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 worldview, um, that that this this these people could not be helped. Whereas the William Carey who went to India was more more an incarnational model where he learned the, the language, the uh, the philosophy translated Indian philosophy for Western uh, for the West, uh, and they were saying that you know it was more an incarnational model, mm -hmm. which was very like for me. Um, I, I without being overly critical because I think like you said no one has mastered this, but it, it kind of I could see that the value of the difference, and even now in in, in our ministry, you know how how we apply those ideas. So. You know, just to say, I think it's a good thing to, to think about because, yes, we can go to the, all the world, but we can do it in so many different ways. So one, just a comment. My second thing is a, a question. Um, usually to do this depth of, of study and try to present something in this field, uh, what, what was the driving force? What is your burden? Um, was there an incident? Like I had an incident in church that that uh, at one season told me to never to go back again. Now I'm a pastor. Um, uh, it was a lot of study. Yeah. Between the, the yeah. Two. Was there an incident in your practice, in your ministry that said, okay, we need to figure this out? But I think I'd be interested. Yeah, in you know, I, I don't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say there was an instance. It was more of a a narrative. It's uh, you know. Uh, that you know, I can I can trace back. Um, well, I would just stick with tracing back to why missional ethics, why why I'm interested in in have been thinking about this for 15 years. Part of this driven by personal engagements with uh, with international students, not only in the seminary but also at UNO. University of New Orleans and, and wanting to understand how can I how can I better understand who and where you are and how can I better communicate to you who and where I am, if that makes sense. And so that's 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 one aspect of another aspect of it is it is in my physician, particularly as a and as a Southern Baptist, uh, I've been asked to to come to and or to go to, for me to go, but to come to Cuba and teach ethics, and to come to Bolivia and teach ethics, to come to Uganda and teach ethics, to come to Latvia and teach ethics. And for the most part, I was going to these places thinking, what in the world am I, you know, you know, partly I, I don't know the language. Except in Uganda, <laughs> and that is just because English is a common language there. I don't know in the tribal languages of the, the, the students that I engage there. 
But, um, and so I went in, in part, I had something to say, but I had to say it from my own context, which can be a dangerous thing, right? But also I went in with open ears. And so as part of this, trying to say, can I, can I, you know, if I continue to have this privilege, and I do see it as a privilege to come alongside of the church in different places and, and talk about ethics and talk about morality and, and so forth. And I want to be prepared to do that. Uh, you know, related to that is as a, as a Western theologian born and raised in the United States, educated in the United States. Uh, you know, when I am and, and, and asked to teach ethics and, and so I teach uh, biblical ethics, I teach a Christian ethics. It's just, the, the basic that has a biblical component, a historical component, a, 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 a practical component, those sorts of things. Um, and, and I teach on master's level, doctoral levels. And so when we get into the history of ethics, I'm deep into the philosophical development of ethics in the West, you know, through Europe, and then, but, but also moving into, you know, uh, Confucius, Confucian thought and, and, and the development of ethics and other contexts, but not to a great extent. So when I teach ethics, I, I, I'm pretty much in te teaching the categories uh, of, uh, of the way ethics has been considered. So, you know, the, the, the same old uh, categories of, you know, deontological, which is, you know, uh, a, 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 the study of, of, uh, of uh, oh boy, I just went blank on me. I've been away from it so long. Of <laughs> uh, well, the deontological ethics, which is a rule-based ethic. I think of Immanuel Kant and others in that ilk. Um, and uh, what I call ontological ethics, or or the ethics of being, which is uh, character and virtue, or any number of consequentialist ethics that we have floating around in the West from, uh, from the utilitarianism of the, of the 17th century to a modern ethic in, in, in this common in the West now. And one of the questions I began to ask was, why, why, is, why do we talk about these things? Why, why, why in the West have these, you know, root law, Law and commands, character and virtue, and then the, the consequences. Why does that keep coming up? Why is why 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 do we battle over these things philosophically? And I've, I came to the conclusion, at least to satisfy myself, that we battle over these things because this is actually the nature of the of the moral way that God has created this world, and that. Um, and I'm not interested in teaching anything that I can't, it, it can't in, a, in a sense, go to who God is and how God has revealed himself to us in Scripture and see a connection that, yes, this is an important part, a robust nature, a robust ethic, if you please. And so just in short, yeah, I think that commands and law and rules are, are, are an important part of of the, of the moral life. Why? Because God is actually a commander. He, he, and when God spoke, he, 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 and part of that speaking was to say, these are things that I want you to do, and these are things that you ought not to do, in spite of the fact that the whole fall was driven by your desire to know the knowledge of good and evil without reference to me. And so commands and law, I think, are part and parcel of, of what we can do in ethics. And I think it can translate in some form or fashion uh, to any, any context. The same is true with character and virtue. We, you know, we think of, uh, we think of the, uh, the fruit of the Spirit of God. We think of the Beatitudes. That's the language of character. We, th we think of you know, being conformed in the image and likeness of Christ. That is... The goal of our of, of our character that's our telos is the is the um, the Greeks like to talk about in terms of virtue. 
and and the and the church fathers like Augustine and then uh, and then the Thomistic ethics as well. So yes, rule and command is important. Yes, character and virtue are important. By the way, what rest in those would be those cultures that are that are more apt to to be driven or understand morality through law and commands, and what rest in the character and virtue of those more those those uh, kind of contexts in which which shame and honor are so important. And so those are even tied to a robust ethic. And then even consequences of it inspire the fact that I I tell my students never have a system of ethics in which the motive or the, or the end justifies the means. But does that mean that we, we ignore the ends? Well, if we ignore the ends, we ignore an important part of every moral decision we make because every moral decision has motive, means, and, and ends and consequences. But, uh, but where that rests for me is in the work of the Spirit of God because the work of the Spirit of God is a work helping us understand how to apply uh, the law of God, the commands of God, and how to uh, reflect the character of God and do so in a way that trains the, the way that we, uh, that trains us to think that when I act in a certain way, it has an impact on people that I am supposed to love. And, and so we ought to attend to our ethic, if you please, and how it affects the people around us. And so uh, I think part of that is all, also drove me into this thinking about, about context, about, um, you know, the flesh and blood of our ethic being, being, uh, being worked out in the relationships we have in the church, wherever it is. Thank so you so much. Answer. Precise. <laughs> Thank you. We have um, time for one more brief question. Any any burning question? And Jennings, do you like? Would you like to ask oh. your dad a question? <laughs> he's, he's accustomed to doing that. <laughs> So, I guess not. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much for this very interesting. And if um, I was listening to those who have questions, we all try to locate ourselves into your talk. That means a success, really, because we didn't see it as outside of us, something external, but we try to journey. In while uh, teaching us and telling us that, and thank you so much. Please do thank join you. me to thank uh, Professor Riley. Thank you. And I look forward to how we can read this. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, I've everyone. Got, uh, I'm going to be around for what mm -hmm. two and a half. Four months. Exactly. So you just we'll keep asking me to. How's it going? How's it going? We'll, we'll do that. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Hope to see you next week as Peace well. Tomorrow. Bye. Bye, son. <laughs> Love you. Best of all. Love you too. Trying to find Yes, very religious people. Okay. How do we do that? Yeah, I know. They offer a very kind of